how do we as a care provider feel when we are going through this uh, for us as a difficult time for the family? So we or us sometimes feel ill-equipped Ill -equipped to initiate the conversation because we can care for these families once we feel comfortable with the situation. And sometimes it's our own fear that we, we just hesitate in talking about the D word or the death or the dying because we feel that there is a fear that the family will hurt, will get hurt. They won't like it. But trust me, the family needs to hear these words from us. And then that's the way they feel like that we are there with them in their journey. So, so healthcare providers sometimes, among the healthcare providers, there's a confusion that, oh, which of the providers should take the lead in opening this dialogue? Or trying to finding, trying to find out the right thing to say can be overwhelming for all of us. And sometimes the much of the discomfort that comes from we, the, the culture we are living in, because where the discussion about the death is usually avoided. We all do attend uh, like funerals, condolences, and sometimes, and we, we as their loved ones directly jump in to support in terms of providing solutions or uh, for their um, in their for their difficult time. And we sometimes forget to be there with them without speaking and being a part of the journey because those families, those parents, they know that what to do and how how are they going to live their life afterward. What they need is our presence at at that point of time. So. Yes, we are in a in a world of a modern medicine and we are doing amazing things, but we all are human beings and we live and who live and die. So we should need to normalize death and dying as a part of life. And we need to use the D words when it is required uh, for the patients and families. And when the healthcare provider does this, they, they, they feel connected with the patient and the family. And not only that, this will help their jobs to be rewarding and meaningful for for them and they'll, they'll come up and do the same thing every day uh, without any exhaustion, depersonalization or burnout or compassion fatigue. Um, so this is an end of life care checklist. This is internationally recognized uh, and this has been used to care for these families uh, during this time. And look at this, this has several components and we have to check every single component to, to, to be sure that we are providing adequate end of life care. This includes advanced care planning, which includes all the component regarding the decision making and all. Then it includes symptom control, followed by emotional, social, and spiritual care and the needs, not only of the patient, but also their parents. So the, the fulfillment of the parents and caregiver needs in, in, in giving them the opportunity of expressing their love, their gratitude, their forgiveness, or the farewell to the child. And how can we do that? When we can provide the quality of time um, to the parents with their with their uh, children by fulfilling their basic needs when they are in the hospital. Uh, then there is a care coordination and continuity, uh, followed by some specific tasks and consideration which are required prior to or immediately after that. And by by helping and supporting the family during that time, we are assisting them with staying connected to their uh, child. Um, so and followed by the task to complete that. So the, the initiative we have taken is a part of the international uh, checklist in supporting our families. So before, when, when I did the fellowship and, uh, and after the fellowship, and I, I think before that, and I think this happens everywhere that we like, like we do patients DNR because of the poor prognosis. We do withdrawal of care uh, support. We do compassionate care. So what happens? The family and the parents wait for the child to pass away. And of course, at that time, the child is NPO or maybe on tube feeding. And there is no meals for the family and the child. And they're sitting right seeing them because they have to leave for the Hyderabad and they have to take the body there. So these are the sub personal experiences that we have come across. And emotional and social support no service formally, but yes, it was available on demand for everyone. Our parents were un like unable to fulfill basic needs so that, uh, they, they, because why? They have a fear of losing the sight of their child, especially when they are losing him for the rest of their lives. So they don't want to, they want to eat. They, want, they don't even want to go to the cafeteria to get the food because they feel that something can happen. So how we can help support them? And then some emotional and physical breakdown that we always see in the ICU or the, uh, other other um, uh, units when the when the when there's when when one of the family member passed out right after listening to the news of the death of the child or or maybe during the process and how we can help support them during that time. Uh, 
So that I just thought of doing a personal piloting of something, uh, arranging some food stuff and giving to the family and telling the nurse that, okay, just tell them this is a hospital service and see how does it go. And the other, the other purpose of doing this was to make the nurse feel better that he, she is doing something for the family. And then I used to come after three hours and see what happened with the food. He said, they ate because that was available and they ate it. So, and it was very well received with the families of these patients. And I think the nurses felt very happy and satisfied because there was less moral distress and they feel satisfied in caring for these families and all. And then with all these uh, experiences, we came up with the plan of having a bereavement tray, which is a care for all, not for supporting the parent of the dying child, but supporting the parent itself, the family, the care provider. And then I vividly remember when Dr. Abbas and Dean Adil visited uh, the, uh, several departments during the faculty meetings. And I remember uh, uh, your visit in our in, in the pediatric department. And it was early 2023. And, and they were very supportive for new ideas and all. They said, come to us, discuss the new ideas. But do think about reallocating the resources that we are using and come up with something um, New, so that stuck with me, and that 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 the, the the conversation stuck with me, and then we thought of doing doing uh, several things within the same resources and come up with a plan, an idea that can help support these families. So I I won't be talking in detail about this. Noreen will be telling about how we how we got to this, but this was something that led to uh, do this briefment tray for all. So th these are the experiences that I witnessed because. I am the one who's there representing the whole hospital, the primary teams, the nurses, um, the, maybe the leadership and the hospital uh, being there with the family during this difficult time, during the time of the death or after the death. So this was an experience from a eyewitness that's a six year old grieving sister who was there right there with her um, um, elder sister who just passed away and the family was just waiting for the ambulance and the body was all wrapped. They wanted to leave. The, the sister said that, I am so hungry. Can I have this custard which is there in the tray? And the tray was right there for the family as a bereavement tray. And th this was about the death of a 14-year-old girl. Uh, she was a very um, beloved patient with ALL relapse. And then we, um, we, we witnessed that parents uh, uh, appreciated the care from the hospital. Like they, re they, they thought that hospital remembered the family. And this was the death of a three year, 10 one old, um, our cute naughty boy who had an AML relapse and he died in, a, in the hospital. And then there was no cure, but the family felt cared for by the hospital. And the family was very appreciative. This was the death of a five month old baby girl who had autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease and he died in our own hospital. And then very recently, uh, when I was there caring for uh, this lovely family and the parents, um, the tray was available to break the fast of the mother because she kept the fast especially for the child and then she, she had a feeling that he will get better. I am praying for them. And because that, that fasting and that, um, that religious um, uh, recitation of um, uh, Suras was her only strength to keep the child alive. So the tray was there. She broke her fast right after death. And this was about the death of a seven-year-old boy who, who passed post-liver transplant with the complication um, of lymphoma in our uh, in our own PQ. And this this is the feedback, which is a very open, fresh feedback we received yesterday, right after when the mail was circulated through conference secretariat. And she's one of our employees. And she sent this message um, yesterday after the email that 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 she's very appreciative of AKU um, uh, uh, taking this initiative and supporting this parent. Maybe she has gone through her uh, personal experience with that. So I am so so grateful for the opportunity and and for I uh, do the leadership right from the beginning. The the hospital um, CEO CMO. CEO, a dean, uh, both of our chairs, and all the department colleagues from both the department, my friends, and especially all the people who are deeply invested in establishing something to support um, and care for these patients and families. And I think without this, this cannot happen. It's not about just the resources. It's about coming together with the thought to help support these families. And I think I cannot be much blessed enough than that uh, to have this opportunity and the platform to do because this is the trust you have in me. And I'll and if with this trust, I hope I'll keep doing with the team support to help support the family. 